do some of the world's most creative people develop their creative ideas? Find out on today's episode of the Freedom Club Podcast. Welcome to the Freedom Club Podcast, where we discover the fight for freedom, fulfillment, passion, and purpose. Your host is Kurt Mercadante, Gallup Certified Strengths Coach, an agency founder who is dedicated to coaching individuals seeking to level up their life and their businesses. The Freedom Club is about unlocking your talents, turning them into strengths, and crushing your objectives. You can learn more at KurtMercadante.com. Welcome to the Freedom Club. And welcome to the Freedom Club Podcast. I am your host, Kurt Mercadante, but I bet you probably already guessed that. I am so happy you are here today. And please don't be shy about telling your friends, your family, your colleagues, anyone you think would benefit from our message of freedom and fulfillment. Don't be shy about referring our podcast to them. And please also don't be shy about leaving us a positive rating or review. Those are like currency to us and allow us to expand our reach across the globe. Listen, on today's episode, I am very happy to interview someone who I've known on LinkedIn for about the past six months, Alan Gannett. He is CEO of marketing analytics firm TrackMaven, and he wrote a wonderful book. He asked me to pre-order it back in December. Finally got it about a month ago, and I was not disappointed. The name of the book is The Creative Curve, how to develop the right idea at the right time. And in this book, Alan demolishes the myth that creative people come up with their ideas through these sort of aha moments. He talks about the right brain, the left brain. How can you train yourself to be more creative? How the world's most creative people spend 20% of their waking hours actually consuming content in order to get inspired. But I'll let Alan tell you the story. On today's episode of the Freedom Club Podcast, here's my interview with Alan Gannett. All right, so I am here with Alan Gannett. He is CEO of Track Maven and author of a wonderful book that I had the pleasure of reading, The Creative Curve, How to Develop the Right Idea at the Right Time. Alan, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me, Kurt. And um, you and I have followed each other on LinkedIn for, I don't know, six or seven months. and What's uh, LinkedIn? I don't know what yeah. you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's a lot of people out there probably asking that same question. <laughs> don't tell them, right? It's, it's, like, uh, it's our secret, I, yeah. I live in Charleston, South Carolina, which is wonderful here, but it's getting really crowded. We're adding like 50 people. <laughs> Bill Murray lives here, and um, the late Anthony Bourdain did a, a, a show here and he was asking Bill Murray about Charleston and how wonderful it is. And Bill Murray looked at him and said, it's horrible here. The mosquitoes are horrible. It's hot. Everyone <laughs> stopped coming. That's how bad it is. So sometimes I want to tell people that about LinkedIn too, you know? That's amazing. <laughs> so Alan, before we get in, I want to get into the book, um, obviously. But a question I, I ask all my guests is, and you know, you're someone who has built a company. You obviously had a dream of, of writing and publishing a book. You did that. And so you have a certain amount of freedom that you have built in your life. So a question I, I like to ask my guests is, what does the word freedom mean to you? Mm. I think for me, it is the absence of coercion. I think I have a very strong distaste towards being coerced into doing something, um, which for me is basically you have to do this or else. And um, I just don't like being in those situations. I find them, I I think I, you know, growing up as an only child of very divorced parents who divorced when I was very young and both Mm -hmm. had very full-time jobs. I had a lot of time by myself. And so I think I just sort of developed generally into someone who like likes being very self-reliant and very independent and, you know, I didn't grow up really, like my parents were working all the time. And so I just, um, there wasn't a ton of like uh, people saying, do this or do that. And I think that just has become my sort of natural rhythm. And uh, yeah, yeah, and I just, I can't handle it. <laughs> I'm not good working for other people. I found yeah. this out. I, I did it once and it was not good. <laughs> it's interesting. I, I, I had to learn that. And I always knew that I wasn't good working for other people. And I always wanted to start my own business. But I also, I had to go through a process where freedom for me also wasn't having a team of people working for me in the same office where I had, mm. I felt guilty if I wasn't in the office. <laughs> totally. So I had to build a, you know, a, a uh, uh, and that's totally cool, you know, because when you, every single one of us has our own unique strengths 
and what we do. And, and if we claim that as our own, we don't feel guilty. We, we, you know, we can be more of ourselves and, um, which, which leads me to, you know, you write about this in the book, you know, track Maven is a marketing analytics firm. And at the beginning of the book, you talk about this and it's obviously very apparent that you are someone who is very into and prone to looking at pattern recognition. And um, as someone, I had a public affairs firm and we did a lot of advertising and did a lot of uh, work with a lot of data, right? I was never anyone who understood any of it. <laughs> I, could, I could have other people like, synthesize it down and then I could be like, okay, let's go with it. Um, but you know, the gist of your, of your book is, is really going through some of these, um, and I've told people about it and I've actually used some principles in your book already with some of my clients, Yeah, <laughs> the, the myth of the, uh, that creativity is all this aha moment that people are just yeah. walking down the street struck by lightning. And some of what you do is look at some of the patterns that led people. I love the story you start with, with Paul McCartney. So the Paul McCartney story to me is one of these, it's, it's amazing because it's one of these stories that's been told and retold so many times. And it's basically the story of how Paul McCartney came up with the song yesterday, which is the most recorded song in history. And the story literally goes, he dreamt the melody and he woke up and he remembered the six notes and he, you know, started playing them at the piano and he was sort of in shock. He felt like he had this big epiphany and he actually was so anxious about this epiphany, maybe he had accidentally plagiarized it or, you know, somehow stolen it, that for a couple of weeks he went around to his friends and was like, um, have you heard this before? They were like, no, Paul, we haven't. He's like, are you sure? And um, a little fun historical side note about this story is that he only dreamed up the melody, not the lyrics. And so at one point when he was playing the song for someone, um, someone came in and offered them scrambled eggs. And so for a while he used the placeholder lyrics, scrambled eggs, Oh, my baby, how I love your eggs. And so, um, you know, this sort of, this notion of, scram of yeah, scrambled eggs, this notion of yesterday is really this example of this sort of inspiration. It went on to become the most recorded song in history. And wow, voila. But it's also a great example of how BS that notion is. Because the reality is that how our brain works is our right hemisphere is constantly connecting new and different ideas together, but more distant ideas, like unrelated ideas. And it's constantly doing this. And um, it works on the sort of data it has, so to speak, the ingredients it has. And what you find when you talk to creative achievers, is one of the things that's really common among all of them is that they're huge consumers. And there's that sort of social media meme you might've seen that's kind of annoying. That's like, you know, 90% of people consume, 90% engage, 1% create, hashtag hustle. And right. the reality is that when you actually look at these great consumers, these great creatives, sorry, they are great consumers. Like, you know, Paul McCartney grew up in a musical household surrounded by musical parents. He literally played in a cover band. And so for years he was ingesting, you know, melodies and ideas around music. And then, yeah, so when he dreams, he does occasionally dream about music. And that's actually not that weird. It's actually pretty rational. And it turns out, the melody for yesterday is very, very similar to um, uh, Ray Charles's version of George on my mind. And it <laughs> isn't to say it's plagiarism because all music is evolution. I mean, Ray Charles's version was a sort of reinterpretation of Carmichael's version. And so what you see when you actually start looking at these things is that a lot of what we think is magical is really just things that are subconscious. Yeah, it's, it's and I love the part in the book where you, you kind of almost talk about I don't want to say training your brain, but <laughs> how almost, you know, the right and the left brain work. And it's almost like when the left brain goes down a little bit and the right brain's up and you, you catch it at the right time when the left brain is shut off. That's yeah. when all of a sudden you have this, what we think of as an aha moment when it's really yeah, always so, in there. Yeah. So basically your right brain and left brain are constantly processing information. Your left brain processes information, doing more sort of step-by-step um, -step logical processing. And this all happens consciously. Like think about when you're working through solving a math problem, like it's very step-by-step. -step. You're aware of every step. You're aware of the long division that you're doing. And so what you find is that, I think the analogy that speaks to people the best is think about your left brain and your right brain. Think about them as like two different lab partners you had in college. 
your left brain is that like loud lab partner who, you know, he's the captain of the lacrosse team, but he's also smart and he never shuts up. And in lab, he's like, okay, we're going to do this and then this and then this. And look, we got the answer. Good job, team. And you're like, why is everything a team? And then your right hemisphere is the like quiet, dorkier lab partner who sort of, you know, they're quietly working by themselves. And only once they're done do they say, hey, I got it. And if your loud lab partner, if your left hemisphere is too loud, you can't actually hear what's been going on in your right hemisphere. So this is why people experience aha moments like in the shower or on a commute or when they're running. It's not that your um, commute is inspiring. It's literally just that your left hemisphere is quiet. And this is the same reason why you know, drugs and alcohol are so tied to creativity. These are all things that you know, suppress your left hemisphere processing. So you don't have to like, you know, do drugs, just go on a run. Interesting. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. And, and the, um, it, it, it spoke to me for a variety of reasons. One is that, uh, and I can't remember his first name for the life of me, but Andres, the chef uh, that you were. Yeah, Jose Andres. Jose, yeah. We, and when my wife and I lived in DC for uh, four years and went to uh, his restaurant, I think, I want to say it was Cafe Atlantico several times. Mm -hmm. um, but you write about, you know, his inspiration for the sea air margarita, uh, and, and, and to, but you, not just him, but all creative people. And when, when people are listening to us talk about creative people, you're not just talking about uh, musicians and artists. You talk about chefs. You're talking about, you know, anyone who has to be creative to live, right? And, yeah. And think of and, new ways. And one of the things I think is interesting is I think so often we pigeonhole our concept of creativity into the arts. But the reality is that creativity is becoming part of every job, especially as more and more professional skills are getting automated by AI. I think it's going to be even more important. And even further than that, what I think is interesting is that, you know, creativity really is the most useful in the least creative industries. Like, it's great to be creative at Google, but like everyone's creative at Google. Where you can really make a name for yourself is if you're in HR, if you're in IT, if you're in these functions, which are traditionally are not that creative, that's where the biggest delta is. And so I think oftentimes people say, well, that's not my job function. That's not my industry. I shouldn't worry about being creative. But I think if we look to the future and we see software and AI and all these things replacing a lot of high skill jobs, I think creativity is the thing you have to do. And I think right now there's still a big opportunity to differentiate yourself. Yeah. And, and, the, and I know you mentioned it earlier, but I, I want to go back to it, that it, it's so important that consumption, that 20%. Of a, of a person's basically waking hours, right? Uh, the, the most creative people is that consumption, whether it's going to a conference, reading a book, listening to a podcast. Um, and I find that so important in my life. I start off every day with reading a hundred pages and it could be a, it could be a biography. It could be fiction. And it's amazing how it primes my brain and gives me ideas. It could be a science fiction novel and still give me some sort of an idea that just springs into my brain. Uh, it, it, yeah, a hundred percent. My brain, right? It, it's <laughs> maybe it was always there. Well, and this is the thing. I think. I think oftentimes, I think some of the bad advice on creativity is like, oh, if you have writer's block, just write through it. And no, 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 no. We actually know that these really great creative achievers often take long breaks. I mean, you think about some screenwriters who will just take years between writing and. I think the thing which you find is that the real commonalities among creative achievers is the amount of time they spend sort of intentionally getting inspired, right? Intentionally going out and consuming. And, you know, people who are in music are just constantly seeing what's out there, what's new. They want to understand because that's what gives them those raw ingredients to work on and to develop into new and novel ways. So I talk about in the book, this pattern I found where you know, these great achievers, they typically spend about 20% of their waking hours, like three to four hours a day, consuming specialized knowledge. And that could be reading, conversations, watching, and it's a huge amount of time. But for them, that's what really gives them those things because great ideas don't happen in a vacuum. Great ideas are judged relative to the ideas that have become before them. And so since we have this whole sort of social construct of creativity, it's really, really important to also just know what's out there. Yeah, and, and this, the book, was it something that, came over time that you really, you had this idea for 10 years and you finally got around to writing it. Was it something that, that uh, was kind of spur of the moment, a combination of both? 
Yeah, so I have always been a huge reader of nonfiction books and business books. Like I just really love the genre and you know pop psychology or whatever you want to call. And you know, there's a lot of mildly pejorative names, you know, airport books. And um, so I've always been a big fan of it. And I had been writing for Fast Company this monthly online column. And I sort of my my sort of the type of writing I was doing was writing sort of pop psychology pieces, but with a lot more science and rigor than I think a lot of stuff that's out there. And I found that people seem to resonate really well. And so I sort of had this idea generally that in pop psychology, there was room for books with a little more density to them. Cause I think a lot of the books suffer from the first chapter makes a point and then the rest of the chapters are just stories sort of supporting the point, which I think gets kind of dull. And so I sort of had that notion. And then I was working with all these creatives and marketing. I just kept hearing these sort of like creative doubts and creative insecurity where, you know, people are like, oh, I'm not that creative. And I just got sort of frustrated with that. And those two sort of things connected together where I sort of realized that, hey, this sort of style of writing that I've been working on online, um, I think would work really well to tackle this subject, which is, you know, write something that's very approachable, very readable, but it's just more academically rigorous than um, sort of the typical book. In the typical or the typical article. Got it. Yeah. And, and I, so I purchased the book on Amazon. I pre-ordered it. Um, if people want to buy the book, learn more about you, where is the best central hub? And I'll, I'll put all the links, <laughs> and I'll put all the links yeah. in the show notes, but where's the best place for them to go? So the book's website is thecreativecurve.com. And you can watch a very silly, very silly trailer uh, with my uh, adorable Corgi. And then uh, my website is just Alan, A-L-L-E-N dot X-Y-Z. That's awesome. Yeah, I, someday you'll have to tell me how you got that as well for your Instagram handle. <laughs> <laughs> well, Alan, thank you so much for being on the show. It's been an honor and a pleasure. And I thoroughly enjoyed the book. Thanks, Kurt. Bye. Bye. Take care.